How Shakespeare Changed Everything, an excerpt from the article written by Stephen March. Chunk 1. Shakespeare described the terrifying beauty of the adolescent so early in its development, and so definitively, and so thoroughly, that it is only a slight exaggeration to say that he invented teenagers as we know them today. Romeo and Juliet, his extended study of the humiliations and glories of adolescence, is the biggest hit of all time. Everybody knows the story, even if they haven't seen the play. Just one year after its first performance in 1596, the Quarto publication proclaimed that it hath been often, with great applause, played publicly. Unlike most of Shakespeare's plays, it has never slipped out of fashion. Hamlet, Shakespeare's other great play about adolescence, is the only piece performed more regularly on stage. And when you consider how often and how successfully Romeo and Juliet has been adapted into other media, into operas and ballads and musicals, its popularity is even more staggering. The most popular brand of Cuban cigars? Romeo y Julieta. People just love to watch a couple of dumb kids make out and die. And they are awfully young. These dumb Veronese kids who make out for us and then die? Shakespeare doesn't ever tell us Romeo's exact age, but we know about Juliet. In the first act, her nurse discusses her age at length, and it's creepy. In two weeks, she will be 14. Chunk 2. Romeo and Juliet has to be fudged. In the 18th century, David Garrick understood that his audiences wanted a pure and innocent Romeo and Juliet, and he gave them a sentimentalized version of the play, which was so much more to their liking that his version survived intact for over a century. To make the young lovers totally heroic, he had to make them less complicated. The first thing to go was Romeo's love for Rosaline at the beginning of the play. Romeo's mooning over another girl is embarrassing to everybody. He seems unreliable, and it's a bit insulting to Juliet. Garrick's audience wanted Romeo and Juliet to be proper first lovers. He gave the audience what it wanted. He also fiddled with several lines in order to remove, in his words, the jingle and quibble, which were always thought a great objection to performing it. He cut the dirty jokes. And he also cut down on the rhyming. It made the lovers seem too silly and too unrealistic. The biggest change, however, was the death scene. Garrick let Juliet wake up before Romeo is properly dead, a flamboyant effect that is not in the original. Garrick created teenagers who were icons of purity in a corrupt adult world. But Shakespeare, unlike Garrick, never spares his adolescence their ridiculousness. The first snatch of dialogue between Romeo and Juliet is beautiful and absurd. Notice that the dialogue follows the rhyme pattern of a Shakespearean sonnet. Romeo If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this, my lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Juliet, good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Romeo, have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? Juliet, I, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Romeo, oh then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Juliet, saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Romeo, 
Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. They kiss. Thus my from my lips by yours my sin is purged. Juliet. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Romeo. Sin from thy lips? O oh, trespass sweetly urged, give me my sin again. He kisses her. Juliet. You kiss by the book. The vague but palpable effect of this sudden advent of A B A B C D C D E F E F G G rhyme is inexplicable beauty. Only the sharpest members of the audience could conceivably be sharp enough to notice that the lovers have dipped into sonnet form. But Shakespeare Shakespeare leaves us with an inarticulate impression that the young lovers are somehow strange and magical. Garrick took the sonic out of the scene exactly because it made their love seem too ridiculous and artificial. But Shakespeare wants them ridiculous. That's how kids are. And that last line is perfect. You kiss by the book. It sounds to me exactly like what a 13-year-old girl says after a first kiss, like she's been kissing forever, like she knows all about kissing, like she's read the book. Chunk 3. Nothing could seem more natural to us than the rebellion of teenagers, which explains why Romeo and Juliet has fit easily into 20th century pop culture. Irving Berlin referred to the pair in a bunch of different songs, as have Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, Tom Waits, Dire Straits, Alanis Morissette, Aerosmith, Elvis Costello, and the Indigo Girls. Lou Reed's Romeo and Juliet is a surprisingly conservative retelling of the story. On the street, the young dealers dream of automatic weapons, random murder, and the decline of Western civilization. Inside, Romeo clutches across and Juliet. The young in Lou Reed's song are the harbingers of apocalyptic social decay, and their only redemption is the love they preserve against the despair everywhere around them. In The Wild One, a woman at a bar asks Marlon Brando what he's rebelling against. What do you got? He slurs back. The teenage rebel cannot say. I believe that the incidental tax rate is too high for local corporations. Or our agribusiness policies are short-sighted. No, that would not be nearly stupid or grand enough. The most important feature of adolescent rebellion is that it's doomed. It must come to an end. In this, as well, Shakespeare was right at the beginning. He defined what it means to be star-crossed. The opposition between the adolescent and the mature orders of the world can have only two possible endings. One is comic. The teenager grows up, develops a sense of humor, gets married, has kids, moves to the suburbs, gets fat, and becomes boring. That's what happens to most Romeos and Juliets. The other is tragic. The teenager blows up in a blaze of glory. We much prefer to live in the comedy. We much prefer to watch the tragedy. Shakespeare loves his teenagers as he paints them in all their absurdity and nastiness. That basic honesty, neither idealizing nor afraid, has kept Romeo and Juliet fresh. Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes became the dominant young actors of their generation through their performances in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Justin Bieber, with his swagger coach and overwhelming fame, comes appropri appropriately from Stratford, the home of America's biggest Shakespeare festival. Shakespeare created this category of humanity, which now seems as organic to us as the spring. In place of nostalgia, 
and loathing, Shakespeare would have us look at teenagers in a spirit of wonder, even the spotty ones and the awkward ones and the wild ones. They're us before we fall into categories, not children, not adults, not monsters, not saints. They're beautiful because they do not fit. They're too much themselves and not enough.